Hey, good morning, church. Why don't you stand with us? We're going to worship the Lord together this morning. Whatever you came in here with this morning, let's just lay it at the feet of Jesus. Let's focus on him this morning. Let's praise him with everything we have. Are we ready? Are we ready, church? Come on. Let's sing. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms may wait for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see, I see your promises in fulfilled. of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Amen. We cry fall face down and we worship we all cry out you are worthy God you are worthy God come on we crown you we 
fall face down and we worship, we all cry out, you are worthy, God, you are worthy. Son of God, in all his innocence, you're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Oh, man of sorrow, son of suffering, of blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. down. 
Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Every voice sing hallelujah to the son of suffering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the son. Let's have to shout a praise to our God. Amen. You guys can have a seat this morning. This is not a vlogging channel because our last moments need to be on video. Yeah, so whoever finds this camera, we love you. We hope you get to experience Jesus through us Jesus and be the light of the world. Jesus, Jesus loves, loves you. you.
Who's in my family? Yeah, if you looked at a picture of ours, we'd certainly look different. We have two biological children, we have three adopted children. So certainly if you look at a photo, you see brown hair, you see dark skin, you see blonde hair. And certainly we do get weird looks, but the great thing is seeing the Lord work and do things that you never even dreamed possible. The call to adopt came out of intimacy with the Lord, just like our calling to plant this church. I'm the church planting pastor of Refuge Church in the Ortega community of Jacksonville. We've been here about two and a half years. It was a community that was very unreached, and being there, the Lord just began to kind of do something in our heart. We didn't set out to plant a church for foster and adoptive families. It really just happened. The Lord did it. A lot of our church has become people from this community who are fostering or who are adopted. So we share that in common. People are longing for community. And when you add the layer of taking on people and children from difficult places, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think the reason they've shown up here, there's a big closet full of diapers and shoes and strollers and car seats. And they see that and they come here to get a need met. Through that, they build a relationship. Next thing we know, they're in our church on a Sunday. And I think about the amount of children who come to our church who, if families didn't say yes to foster care and adoption, uh, those, those children would never hear about Jesus. They'd never hear the gospel. This is the calling that God has for us. And when people give to Annie Armstrong, you're able to support those who are on the front lines of gospel work. And people hear the gospel who would never have a chance to hear the gospel. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Uh, I got to see a little bit of a spring retreat. We're thankful for opportunities for our students to get to go and uh, spend a weekend just uh, in fellowship, but also uh, just in um, growing in a deeper relationship with God. Thank you for all the leaders that went and the students that went. And we saw a video of Annie Armstrong. So we are continuing in our Annie Armstrong Easter mission offering. And so our goal as a church is $15,000, and that will go, 100% of that will go to support church plants all over North America. And I want to update you on one thing. Uh, I got a, a message from our gospel partner in the Middle East, and um, they had Palm Sunday this morning, and there they are, walking through the streets. And so um, he wanted me to let you guys know that through your obedience that we were able to help them construct a church, a larger church in uh, their city in a very um, difficult place and restricted nation, if you will, and to let you know that it was packed full and people couldn't get in. <laughs> so uh, that's awesome. They go through the streets every year proclaiming the gospel and preaching the gospel. And um, so I just wanted to share that with you. And so that'd be an encouragement to you that God is doing things all over the world. And so we thank him for that. So let, let's, uh, let's just praise God for what he's doing, all right? That God is good. And, um, you know, he's, he's working in spite of us and through us at the same time, which is awesome. So uh, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. Uh, we'll be in chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. You can step back and stop over at Next Steps right there in the back, and they'll make sure they give you a Bible of your own. We're going to continue in our series, though, uh, Testify, and this morning, the title of our message is, It is Finished, and so uh, we're heading into uh, Easter next Sunday, and today is Palm Sunday, what we refer to as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the week leading up to Resurrection Sunday. Easter is when Jesus, as we talked about last week, came into Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey, uh, fulfilling prophecies of people who are all there clamoring, welcoming him in with palm, breaches, palm branches, which is why in the Middle East they, they use that. They're waving those in cloaks and they're throwing these things down on the ground and just saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us, save now. And all this stuff is going on from Palm Sunday. And then we get into the rest of the week, which is what we're going to look at uh, this morning. So if you want to stand with me as we worship God by reading his word in John chapter 19, we're going to read the whole chapter. Uh, I know it's a little bit long, but we need to get a picture of everything that's going on. God's Word said in chapter 19, verse 1, Then Pilate, remember Pilate is the governor, took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapping his face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, them being the Jewish leaders, Look, I'm bringing to him out to you, 
to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, here is the man, or behold, the man. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. And Pilate responded, take him and crucify him yourselves, since I find no grounds for charging him. We have a law, the Jews replied to him, and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. He went back into the headquarters and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. And so Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered, if it had not been given to you from above. And this is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From that moment, Pilate kept trying to release him, but the Jews shouted, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside, and he sat down on the judge's seat in a place called the Stone Pavement, but in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was a preparation day for the Passover, and it was about noon, and then he told the Jews, here is your king. And they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, should I crucify your king? And we have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And then he handed him over to be crucified. Then they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, which is an Aramaic called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, but Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven into one place, one piece from the top. And so they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. And this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says they divided my clothes among themselves and I cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were Mary, his mother, the mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and disciple, he loved, that's how John refers to himself in his gospel, standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed the sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and our King. We thank you for the testimony of the gospel writer John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to proclaim these truths to us this morning. God, and I pray the Holy Spirit, you would now be our teacher and our guide as we worship you through your word, as we study your word, asking you that you would transform us and conform us more and more into the image and the likeness of your Son, Jesus. It's his in name we pray. Amen. You guys have a seat. And so I said, today is Palm Sunday. And as people were riding in, and Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, it was basically very reminiscent of when King David would have appointed his son Solomon to be the next king to take over the throne. And we know through the Old Testament that Solomon rode in on the uh, royal mule of King David, signifying that he, in fact, was the new king, that he was the son of David who would reign as king. But now as Jesus comes into Jerusalem at the beginning of the week on Palm Sunday, the son of David, Jesus being Jesus, rode into Jerusalem declaring that he was the king for all of eternity. Now, the city of Jerusalem had been home to about forty to 60,000 people, about the size, uh, similar to the size of Grove City. But during the Passover, that town would grow in population to about two to two and a half million. And so think uh, every other fall in Columbus, when that team from up north visits Columbus, and that city just begins to explode with people. And so think two to two and a half million people in a size that's about three, maybe in square miles, three times the size of Grove City in square miles. That's, that's, a, that's a small region for two and a half million people. 
And so the, Jew, the, the, the Romans hated this time. They hated it because things had a tendency to go sideways. You've got two to two and a half million people coming into this area. They're coming in with religious agendas, political agendas. There's always an opportunity for some type of riot or uprising. And so Rome couldn't stand when this happened. They were on high alert. And now you got this guy, Jesus, coming into town, which elevates it even a little bit more. And so the Jewish leaders themselves would have been on high alert also. Remember, they had been planning the past two years on how they could kill Jesus to silence him. And now here he comes into Jerusalem, and they're terrified not only of him, but of what could happen. Because if something happened, if there was a riot that broke out, they were going to be blamed for it. And the relationship that they had between Rome and the Jewish people would be fractured. They knew that they would be punished. So needless to say, as Jesus goes into Jerusalem, it's very unstable. I mean, it's a perfect storm for a lot of things to go sideways. But also, we need to remember, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, as the week continues, these crowds that were once cheering for Jesus were now turning against him. His disciples were losing sight of why he came. Even one of his own disciples would betray him. The chief priests and the Pharisees arrested, him, arrested Jesus on false charges, and they beat him, and they, they mocked him, and they brought him before Pilate, the governor Pilate, demanding that he would execute Jesus. And here you have Pilate quickly seeing things were starting to get out of control. He was losing control. And Rome would not be pleased because Rome had already warned him that he needed to have a handle on Jerusalem. There have been too many uprisings and too many riots, and their patience with him was growing thin. But in the midst of all this apparent chaos, Jesus was in full control. All this stuff was happening, and yet Jesus remained in control because nothing that took place was out of the ordinary when it came to God's plan to save people who could not save themselves from sin and death. And so as Jesus is with Pilate, we left off in chapter 18, verse 38 last week, with Pilate asking Jesus this question, what is truth? And we're told in the continuation of chapter 18, after verse 38, he said, after he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. And so the first thing we're going to look at this morning is this crowd. This crowd had been gathering and all these interactions that were happening. So you remember that the Jews, the religious leaders, they needed Pilate's stamp of approval to execute somebody. While the Sanhedrin could gather, the Sanhedrin would be the court of all the religious establishment, they would come together, they could, they could uh, pronounce a sentence on somebody that breaking Jewish law. They could punish people. They could do a lot of different things, but they had to stop short of capital punishment. Rome was the only one that was able to execute anyone. And so it was reserved for those people that were the uh, most heinous criminals, or they were the enemies of Rome. And so Pilate again tells the crowd, he's like, look guys, I find no grounds for execution. I sent him to Herod Antipas. He wasn't entertained with him and sent him back to me. He found no grounds to execute him. He thinks he's just crazy. And so Pilate's like, look guys, we got to get out of this mess. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to flog Jesus, I'm going to whip him, and I'm going to release him. And see, the Gospel of Mark tells us that during the Passover festival, Pilate made it a custom to release a prisoner whom they requested. This custom was done as a goodwill gesture during Passover. It was something to commemorate God freeing uh, his people from Egypt. And so they did it out of goodwill, but really they were doing it to avoid any opportunity for a riot any type of uprising. And so they were doing it for their own benefit, but yet they were making the Jews think, okay, well, we really care about you and your traditions. And so Pilate would release a prisoner that spared him of further punishment or maybe even sometimes death. When the Gospel of Mark, when it talks about this account, it tells us that Pi the crowd told Pilate, hey, we want you to do what you normally do, what you usually do. We want you to release a prisoner. And so Pilate said, okay, well, do you want me to release the king of the Jews, Jesus, to you? See, he thought that this was going to alleviate the whole Jesus problem. 
Okay, I'm going to release this prisoner. I'm going to give him back to you. Surely you, the crowd, you have common sense to know this man has done absolutely nothing, and so I'm going to release him to you. But the Gospels also tell us Pilate asked this question because he knew that the chief priests and the Pharisees delivered Jesus to be crucified out of envy. See, all these people, the chief priests, their desire for power and prominence and protecting what they had built caused them to be envious of this young rabbi. This young rabbi, Jesus, he had no formal training like they did, but yet he taught like no one had ever taught before. He was from a family of nobodies. He was born to a mother, a teenage mom, who actually got pregnant before she was officially married. He would hang out with sinners of all kinds, He was gaining followers. He had disciples. He was beginning to teach them. He raised the dead to life. He healed people. He claimed to be the Messiah from the lineage of David. And so these religious leaders, Pilate knew, they were envious of him. They wanted him to die because they were envious. James, chapter 3, verse 13. James wrote, Who is wise and has understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. James said such wisdom does not come from above, but it is earthly, it's unspiritual, and it is demonic. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every kind of evil. Ultimately, if we dig down to the root of envy, Envy is telling God that we are not satisfied with him or his provision. We're not satisfied with God. This was the position of the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were not satisfied that Jesus would be the Messiah. They expected Jesus to be something more. They weren't satisfied that God had given them what they needed. They were expecting God to have something much different in mind when he sent the Messiah. And so in their envy, they're telling God, we expect something more from you. And because we expect something more from you, out of their envy, ultimately, they're refusing to submit to the authority of God. Now we look at people in Scripture and we're like, we shake our heads at them, but honestly, in our lives, do we not have ambitions? Do we not have wants? Do we not have desires? Do we not at times look at things and think they should be done a certain way? That we look at somebody and say, well, they don't deserve that. Or we look and say, how come I don't have that? They shouldn't have that because I don't have it. And these things that we do, we compare our lives to other people. We compare our jobs to other people. We compare our families to other families. We compare churches to other churches. And we find ourselves discontent with what God is doing in our lives. And we're sitting here, we may may not be calling for the death of a man, but are we not in danger of rejecting God's provision and refusing to submit to his authority in our own envy? Are we truly satisfied with God? Are we truly content with him? I mean, can we honestly say, 100%, individually, I am fully resting and abiding in Christ. I'm fully content in Him. Well, the crowd shouts back at Pilate. And they say, not this man. We want Barabbas. Well, where did Barabbas come from? (laughs) Well, Barabbas was a known revolutionary and a murderer By today's definitions, he would be a terrorist. It's interesting, his full name is Jesus Barabbas. It means son of a father. And so really what's happening here is the wicked son of a father was being embraced while the righteous son of the father was being rejected. There cannot be a more stark contrast between these two choices. 
on the one hand, you have one that is known for taking lives, and on the other hand, you have one who is known as the bread of life. On the one hand, you have one known for creating division and upheaval. On the other hand, you have one who came to reunite the lost sheep to the shepherd. On the one hand, you have one that's condemned, a sinner set free. And on the other hand, you have one that is innocent that would take the place of the condemned man. You see, this whole transaction is a picture of the wickedness within our own hearts. Our flesh craves unrighteousness and despises righteousness. This is why Jesus said in John 3, 19, He said, this then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And so the truth is, for us, left in our own sinfulness, we will always choose darkness over light. You see, the choosing of Barabbas over Jesus was the result of that. The crowd's hearts were hardened to the truth of who Jesus is. And so they did what sinful hearts do. They chose darkness over light. And this is the same for us today. There is a commonality among all people, whether chief priests, Pharisees, Romans, you or I, that apart from God working in our lives, we will always choose darkness even as the light of the world stands right in front of us, we will always choose darkness. Why is that? It's because we don't want the light. Because we know that the light will shine to the deepest, darkest places of our hearts, and it will bring to light all of our unrighteousness. And so what do we do? We run from the light. We try to snuff out the light because Jesus being the light forces us to confess our sins and admit our desperate need for His salvation and His mercy and His grace. But if we would run to the light, if we would embrace the light, Jesus says, I will forgive you of all of your sins. Even all the sins that we hide in the deepest, darkest places of our hearts and minds, Jesus said, I will cast those sins as far as the east is from the west. That we will no longer stand condemned, but we will be called sons and daughters of God. You see what's happening in all this interaction? We read this from thousands of years ago, but God, this is a picture of you and I still today. And so Pilate, being confused by this reaction of the crowd, He's thinking, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm going to release Jesus, and I'm going to come up with another plan. Now, before we get into this, we need to make sure that we are all on the same page concerning Pilate. Pilate was not a victim of circumstance. Pilate was was not an innocent man by any stretch of imagination. Historically, Pilate was not a pleasant person. And in this specific instance, he could have easily denied the request of the crowd and released Jesus. The, The Jews were not in control of Rome. Rome was in control of them. But what was happening is Pilate was more concerned with himself than with Jesus. See, the Gospel of Luke tells us that Pilate told the chief priests and the Pharisees, he said, I'll have him whipped and then I'm going to release him. And so Pilate had Jesus flogged. In the Roman penal system, there's three types of flogging, three types of um, scourging. The first type consisted of whipping the prisoner. And they would do this. It would cause pain, but it wasn't meant to inflict severe punishment. It's kind of a warning. And this was done for minor crimes. The second type was just like the first, except there was a little more severity to it. And then the third type of flogging or scourging was the most severe, and it was reserved for a prisoner that was sentenced to execution. The flogging that John is talking about in John 19.1 was the first type that we discussed. And so Pilate hands Jesus over for this first type of flogging. We're told that when he goes to the soldiers, they twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head, And then they clothed him in a purple robe. They gave him a purple robe, mocking him, representing royalty. The crown itself would have consisted of 12-inch thorns driven into his temples. And Matthew says they placed a reed in his hand as a royal scepter, mocking him, but then took that reed and would hit him over the head with it, the whole time yelling, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapping him and spitting in his face. So this takes place. And then Pilate comes out and addresses the crowd again. He says, look, I'm bringing Jesus out to you here again. I'm telling you, I find no grounds for condemning him to death. And so with great anticipation among the crowd, 
Pilate has Jesus step out, and he walks out so all to see, wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe and carrying a scepter. And the text says, Pilate looked at him and said, Behold the man. Look at this man. This was spoken almost in words of sympathy. Look at him. Look at this poor creature. This is the guy that you're worried about? This guy who has been humiliated and beaten? This is who you're afraid of? This guy is no threat to you or to Rome. Look at him. And the crowd looks at him. And as they're looking at Jesus, you know who they're really looking at? They're looking at God in the flesh. They're looking at God. They were beholding their creator and their redeemer and their sustainer. This bloodied, beaten, bruised man with soldier spit covering his face, standing before them, was their Savior. And I look at him and start yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate is beside himself at this point. And he's like, you take him and crucify him yourself. I'm done with this. I have no reason to execute him. But Pilate knew that Jews could not execute Jesus because of Roman law. But he might have been so frustrated to the point that he could care less if they did crucify and kill Jesus because he was tired of this whole thing. And I think maybe the Jews were beginning to sense they were getting an upper hand on Pilate. And so they look at Pilate and I go, you can't release him. We have a law. And according to the law, Jesus should die. The law that he broke is that he declared that he was a son of God. Well, this was a new charge brought before Pilate. Before, when the Jews came, they tried to tell Pilate he was a, a threat to the political stability, an enemy of Rome, which Pilate says, no, he's not. But now the Pharisees are getting to the real reason why they want Jesus to die, that he claims to be a God. You know, throughout all of world history, religions and people have readily accepted the man Jesus. Even those who deny God, and even those who would deny little gods. Historically, you cannot deny that there was a man, Jesus. And so many people looked at him as a great teacher. Like, oh, Jesus, I, I read what he, he said. He was such a moral guy, such a moral teacher. Uh, his, his love and compassion just inspires me. It inspires. He's such an inspiration. What a great man. Even some religions say, no, he was actually a prophet too. And he could heal people. I mean, what a great guy. But what is it that stirs up in people that causes them to reject Jesus? If some of the world and most of the world would admit, yeah, he was a pretty decent guy. He was a good teacher. We can learn a lot from him. What causes, causes uproar and arguments? And really get down to it. What causes the fear that people have of Jesus? The fear is the deity of Jesus. That Jesus is God. Because if Jesus is God, then all of this is true. If Jesus is God, then good is not good enough anymore. If Jesus is God, you and I cannot continue in our sins. If Jesus is God, we stand condemned before him. And if Jesus is God, that means that you and I have to submit to an authority over us. You see, the name of Jesus struck fear in the hearts of the Pharisees and the chief priests because he claimed to be God, not because he was a man, but who he claimed to be. And this fear and this new accusation struck the heart of Pilate as well. Beginning in verse 8, we see a con so many conversations taking place. In, in verse 8 of chapter 19, when Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever, and he went back to the headquarters and he asked Jesus, where are you from? See, the Romans were very sensitive to spiritual and supernatural things. And so hearing Jesus call himself the Son of God caused Pilate to kind of take a step back and pause on what was actually happening. Remember Pilate's wife, Claudia, sent a note to Pilate 
asking him and warning him not to have anything to do with this righteous man, Jesus, because he was tormenting her in her dreams. And so all of these things are starting to make sense to Pilate. And so Pilate says, Jesus, where are you from? Who are you? And Jesus doesn't respond. Now, now Pilate's really getting agitated because now is not only he mad about the whole situation, now he has some fear. And so Pilate tells Jesus that you need to answer me. Do you not know, Jesus, I have the authority to either release you or crucify you? And look at Jesus' response. You have no authority over me. And he goes on, he says, you have no authority. It has not been given to you by God. I don't know you, I read that statement, and I get excited about this. <laughs> I get excited that Jesus made these comments because Jesus' response to Pilate gives us confidence in who Jesus is. It gives us confidence that his promises will never fail us. It gives us confidence that he will always remain faithful. It gives us confidence that he is who he says he is. It gives us confidence that the wrath of God has been satisfied. It gives us confidence that we are his and he is ours. It gives us confidence that our eternity is secure in him. And it gives us confidence that he is going to return one day. And when he comes, he will rule and reign as the eternal king. And he will defeat unrighteousness once and for all. No one has authority over you that God has not placed in authority over you. No one. What's even best in Scripture, it tells us that in this authority, there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. You know what that means? All these religious leaders... And Pilate himself will hit their knees and worship Jesus. Because he has authority over all things, and nothing happens that God does not allow to happen. God ordained all these things to happen, everything recorded in Scripture. God chose the people, selected the actors to accomplish his perfect will, from Judas to the Pharisees to Pilate. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 17, this is why the Father loves me. Listen, because I am laying down my life so I may take it up again. Listen to what Jesus says. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Church, the sovereignty of God should bring you great comfort. Even in the midst of something as horrific as the crucifixion of our Lord, we can find great comfort that the sovereign God of this universe is active in accomplishing His will in and for our lives and in the lives of people around us. That God is bringing people who are dead to life in Christ. That God is comforting all who are afflicted. That God is a father to the fatherless. So we can be confident in this statement that Jesus like, you have no authority over anything. And so the text tells us that Pilate keeps trying to release Jesus. <laughs> i got to get him out of here. But the Jews keep rejecting it. But what Jesus says in this statement, what he confirms about God's authority and his interaction with Pilate, that Pilate couldn't even release him if he wanted to. Because it was in God's sovereign plan to redeem the world back to himself through the death of Jesus. It was all out of Pilate's hands. It was out of the chief priest's hands. It was all God's plan. You see, the Jews tell Pilate, like, if you release Jesus, you're not going to be a friend of Caesar anymore. Eh. <laughs> Anyone that makes himself a king opposes Caesar. They were threatening Pilate. That if he released Jesus at Rome, Rome's going to know about it. And Pilate is like, well, that's going to interfere with my political dreams and my aspirations, if not my very life. <laughs> Rome did not take, take it lightly when people did not control situations and they put them in positions of power and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They would disappear. You see, ultimately, Pilate feared man more than he feared God. And guys, that's not uncommon today still, even in the life of people who say they are followers of Jesus. Do you strive to please God or do you strive to please man? 
Galatians 1.10 says, I'm trying to persuade, am I trying to persuade people or God? Am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, me, you know me, I'm not a fan of seven steps to a better you at all. But here is the key to fearing people less. You want to know what the key is? How do you fear people less? You fear God more. You want to fear people less in your life? Then you learn to submit to the authority of God and fear Him more than you fear man. This is what was happening with the Israelites and the Pharisees, the Jews. They lost their fear of God. Pilate said, should I crucify your king? And they said, this amazes me, we have no king but Caesar. What? You are the religious leaders of your people, and you say, we have no king but Caesar? They had rejected God as their king. This is very reminiscent in the Old Testament of the Israelites who went to the prophet Samuel, discontent with God as their king, and said, oh, we want a king like all the other nations have. We want to be just like them. It's the same thing that they're doing. But what's even worse, and the irony in this, is by them saying that they have no God but Caesar, denying God themselves. You know what they're doing? They're doing the exact same thing that they're accusing Jesus of, which is blasphemy, saying he should be killed for it. But they're doing the exact same thing. Realizing a riot was going to start, we see here in our last point, the crucifixion, Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. In chapter 19, beginning of verse 16, But before he does, the Gospel of Matthew says that Pilate symbolically washed his hands, declaring that he was innocent of the blood of Jesus. And a crowd's response was, his blood be on us and our children. They were willing to take the responsibility of the death of Jesus, not only on themselves, but putting it also on their children. Surely they had no idea what they were saying. They did not realize that they were more than happy to take the responsibility for the blood of Jesus being spilled and his death. When in reality, it is the blood of Jesus that will cover our sins in his death that frees us from the wrath of God from our sins. And so his blood on them or on us actually frees us and saves us. And so we're told that Pilate releases Barabbas, and then he has Jesus scourged again. And this is the third type of scourging that was mentioned earlier. This was a scourging that was done to a victim that was sentenced to death because in this scourging, the intent was to do everything but kill the prisoner so that they would die more quickly on the cross. But sometimes the soldiers got a little overzealous and they actually killed the man before he had a chance to even be crucified. And so what would have happened is that Jesus would have been tied to a post and he would have been beaten with a leather strap that had pieces of metal and bone on it. And he would have been scourged until his flesh and the muscles were ripped from his body, exposing bones and internal organs. And after surviving that, Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. It's not done yet. We're told that the soldiers continue beating him and mocking him as a king, dressing him in that purple robe and a crown of thorns. He's led through the streets to Golgotha, the place of the skull, which is outside of the city limits. But they take the longest route that they can to humiliate him and parade him through the streets, forcing him to carry the crossbeam of the cross on his shoulders. But along the way, we see in the text that Jesus could no longer carry the crossbeam. And so they grabbed this man named Simon of Cyrene and forced him to carry the crossbeam the rest of the way. And once Jesus reaches Golgotha, he's laid across the crossbeam with his arms stretched out as far as possible. And they would drive nails either into his wrists or into his palms, nailing him to the crossbeam. And they would hoist him up in the air and attach the cross beam to the post that was already in the ground. And then they would take his legs and they would bend his knees just perfectly so his feet would sit on this little platform and they would drive a nail through his feet through to the post so that he could gasp for air. And this was not done out of mercy. This was done so that the agony of death would be even worse. And then the people came and they mocked him. The Gospel of Luke tells us that as they were doing this to Jesus, he was praying to God to forgive them because they did not know what they were doing. And then Pilate had a sign placed above his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
If you notice, it was written in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Aramaic was the language for Palestine. Greek was the language of commerce, and Latin was the language of Rome. So to anyone who came through could read this, and the Jews said, that's not true. He said he is the king of the Jews. Change it. And Pilate says, it says what it says. Now, the Gospels themselves don't mention much of anything about the process of the crucifixion. We know details of the crucifixion through historical records. We know that his physical pain, though, was nothing compared to the spiritual agony that he was about to endure as our sins were being poured out on him, and he endured the wrath of God that we deserve. And we're told that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, and they said, let him save himself. If he comes off that cross, I'll believe then he is who he says he is. Let God deliver him. He says that he's a son of God. Others came and said he saved others, but he can't save himself. Have, have you ever thought that if Jesus would have saved himself, that you and I would still be dead in our sins? He saved us. We're told in the other Gospels that Jesus was crucified with two robbers, one on each side. We're told in the Gospel of Mark that even the robbers mark, uh, mocked him. They reviled against him. But something interesting happens in the Gospel of Luke. One of the criminals is yelling insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But something happens with the other robber, the other thief who was mocking him. And all of a sudden, he looks at the other thief on the other side of Jesus, and he says, don't you even fear God? Since you're undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we are getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Scripture says, Jesus told him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. What, what changed? What changed in that one thief's heart that caused him from going from disbelief to belief? First, there was repentance. He admitted we we're punished justly. So he admitted to and accepted the penalty of his transgression, sin being death. And then there's a recognition. He says, this Jesus has done nothing. He is sinless, meaning he is God. And then realizing who Jesus is, he says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. You see, this thief confessed and believed. And that is all that is necessary for salvation. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead, which we'll talk about next week, you will be saved. And so the acceptance of this man provides a picture of the forgiveness and the eternal life that would soon come, but is now proclaimed in the name of Jesus to the world. The gospel accounts of the crucifixion end with Jesus crying out, Eli, Eli, sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct reference to Psalm 22 because of the time. We're not going to read that entire psalm this morning. I encourage you to read it because it is the prophetic words regarding the crucifixion. The wrath of God being poured out on Jesus. The spiritual agony surpassing the temporary physical pain that Jesus endured, which is true for us. The physical and emotional pain are real but these things are temporary in this world. The spiritual agony of sin and eternal separation from God is eternal for those who reject Jesus. Jesus was bearing the weight and the wrath of God for the sins of all people. And we're told for having been on a cross for about six hours, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. He received sour wine from a sponge, and then he declared, it is finished. Totalistai. It is finished. And in the bowing of his head, he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. Even in death, Jesus was in control. It is finished. Totalistai. It's an action that's been totally completed. It has come to an end. That The debt has been paid in full. And so when Jesus spoke those words, what he came to accomplish in the world had been accomplished. He bore the wrath of God. He died for the penalty of sin our sin, so that you and I may live. And because of that, our debt has been paid in full, and it's a debt that you and I would never be able to pay on our own. Jesus paid it all. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 23 says, when he re was reviled, 
he did not revile and return, speaking of Jesus. When he was suffering, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. You have been healed by his wounds. Then we're told now that darkness covered the land, an earthquake shook the air so strong it was split rocks. That's how hard the earthquake, how, how great the earthquake, the magnitude was. And then a 60-foot high and 30-foot wide curtain from the temple was torn in two, not from the bottom up, but from the top down, signifying that the way to God was no longer through man. The way to God was now only through Jesus Christ. And the sacrificial system was no longer needed because Jesus provided the final acceptable sacrifice as he laid himself on the altar. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so we may become the righteousness of God in him. And the soldiers who had just crucified Jesus at the foot of the cross witnessed all these things and they said, truly, this is the man, this man is the son of God. And we're told that many of the bystanders in the gospel accounts left pounding their chest. God, they weren't pounding their chest out of self-righteousness for what they had just done. The pounding of the chest was a symbolic action of grief and repentance for what they had just done. And then his body was taken down from the cross and laid in a borrowed tomb, and the tomb was sealed. And to steal words from one of the songs that we sing, darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. In his commentary on John, there's a guy named Harry Ironside, and he tells a story of a minister that's been invited to preach the sermon on Sunday morning. And he said this pastor's minister gave a marvelous oration on the beauty of virtue. He said he concluded, Oh, my friends, if virtue incarnate could only appear on earth, men would so be ravished with her beauty that they would fall down and worship her. And many people went out of the service on that Saturday, the Sunday morning saying, What a magnificent oration that was. Ironside said the same evening another man preached, and he did not preach about virtue and beauty. He preached Christ and him crucified. And as he closed his sermon, he said, My friends, virtue incarnate has appeared on earth, and men, instead of being ravished with his beauty and falling down and worshiping him, cried out, Away with him and crucify him, and we will not have this man to rule over us. Ironside said the second man was right. He said, we do not like to hear it, and we resent those who tell us. But the truth is that the natural man hates God's holiness and will do anything rather than allow the light of Christ to penetrate his own deep darkness. And so the question for all of us this morning is, where do we find ourselves? Where do we find ourselves in the crucifixion? I mean, it's all about Jesus and His holiness and His righteousness and His, His glory and God's plan to redeem the world back to Himself. But what do we do with that? Hopefully this morning you've heard all that Jesus has endured for you, both physically and spiritually, that Jesus Christ willingly gave His life for you. And so is the light of Christ penetrating the darkness of your life? But dig down to the real, the real question. Do you believe that this man who died 2,000 years ago on a cross died for the sins of God's people? Or was he just a man? Remember the purpose for which John wrote his gospel in John 20, 31? He said, these things are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so if you believe then, this morning, what is the Holy Spirit leading you to do? Is the Holy Spirit leading you to salvation? That God has been working in your life and drawing you to himself? That over time, and right now the Spirit says, now is the time. Now is the time to surrender your life to the one who gave his life for you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you, you need to take that first step in obedience through baptism, the believer's baptism, to identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To tell the world, I identify with Christ. I am his and he is mine. Maybe the Holy Spirit is just telling you this morning, you need to step out in boldness and share the gospel with the people that God has put in your life. 
that if you have the hope of Christ, go tell somebody. Or maybe the Holy Spirit is moving in your, your heart right now to tell you you need to come to a place of surrender and forsaking all for Jesus and His gospel. I don't know how anyone, any of us, can hear the account of the crucifixion and not be moved to do something. As God works in and through your life, drawing you to salvation that only Jesus made available through his death. He took your sins and my sins bore the wrath of God so you and I may have life and life eternal. But we know the story doesn't end here. To steal the line of another pastor, oh, but Sunday's coming. That not only did Jesus die to take away our sins, but he rose again to give us life. What's the Spirit leading you to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the truth of Scripture. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life as a ransom for us to pay a penalty that we can never pay, a debt that we can never repay. I can't imagine, Jesus, the the spiritual anguish, just uh, let alone the, the pain that you felt. But the spiritual, the spiritual pain. As you being sinless became sin for us. The penalty of our sin placed on you. And you weren't coerced, you did it willingly. because of the love that you have. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts. Each one of us are in a different place. You know where we are, God. You know what we need. You know what you want us to do for you. The Spirit, have your way in and through our lives. Guide and direct us and help us in our obedience to do all it is that you've called us and purposed us to do in Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Are we thankful for the blood of Jesus? It washes us clean. Yeah. Was the cross meant for me that my Savior carried? Now I've been made free by the mercy of God. Was the grave meant for me where my sin lay buried? Now I stand. 
Jesus. Hey, glad to see you here today. Uh, I want to encourage you, invite somebody to come to church with you next week. There's these cards back there in the back. You can take as many as you want. Just leave them as you go out to lunch. Invite people to come to church uh, with you to be your guest next Sunday, or just take a picture of it and mass text it to all your buddies. Like, that would be like three people to me because I don't have any friends. But, uh, so, you guys will be getting them. Anyway, do what you need to do to invite people to uh, be able to share, share the life of Christ that, and what He's done in you and through your life and in your life, and share it with others. So I want to encourage you, if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here today. Stop by our Next Step Center. We'd be happy to meet with you and hear what God's doing in your life. If you have any questions about anything today, any prayer requests, anything like, hey, what do I do here? We'd love to talk to you more and pray with you and uh, help, you, help you figure out what it is that God's doing in and through your life. So with that church, go be the church and take the gospel down the street and around the world.